righty, kids, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. I'm gonna start by telling you how I got started because I'm you. I am exactly who you are, just 30 years older than you guys are, probably more than that. You know, I've known since I was a little kid that I wanted to be a photographer. When I was about five years old, I got my first, um, um, my first taste of photography. My parents discovered at a very early age that if they sat me down on the couch when they would visit friends, I'm the middle child of three girls, that I could be content for hours. And I was always a hot mess and always into everything very ADHD and you name it. And so they found that if, if I, they handed me a photo album, that I could be content for hours. I love pictures. More than that, I love pictures of people. I'm not a bit afraid of people. I think you are the most entertaining, we are the most entertaining creatures on the planet. And so I, I just absolutely embrace the human spirit. And I think that's why I'm still successful after 30 years in the business. And I'm gonna tell you a really quick story of how I got started because I hope that it'll resonate with you and that it'll inspire you to want to do, uh, continue to work this craft because it's a very difficult craft to be in these days as a photographer. Um, in 1982, my husband walked in the door. Uh, we'd been married uh, for about five years. We got married in 1975 at the age of 19. Did I hire a professional <laughs> photographer? No. I hired somebody with a good camera, right? <laughs> Isn't that what a lot of us do? And so um, my husband walked in the door from Georgia. So you'll hear my southern accent come out every once in a while. And he said, hey, baby, how do you feel about moving to California? Well, I'd never been there. So I said, hey, let's go. We sold our house in two weeks and moved. I kid you not. That is the absolute gospel. We made $10,000 on our house, and we thought we were like the Rockefeller, let me tell you. So we moved out to California, and I'm here to say that was the hugest shock, culture, culture shock in the entire world. No, I did not get a job as a photographer. I got a job as an executive secretary. Because back in the early 80s, that's what women did. Women did not become professional photographers. That was a man's thing where you, know, you, you had to be an engineer, basically, to be a photographer, and it's crazy. So at any rate, uh, and that lasted about a year because that was before spell check. And anyone who knows me knows that I like to spell creatively. And uh, I want you to know I graduated from Hardaway High School with a 2.0 GPA. You can take that to the bank. But you know what? I wasn't dumb. I was not interested. Think about that. You know, I just was so not interested. If they had shown me how calculus or how algebra or, or any of those high sciences would have benefited me in what I wanted to do, which was to become a photographer, I'd have been all over that like a bad habit. But they did it. So that lasted about a year working for this, this um, um, oil and gas company as a secretary. And uh, I will tell you this, you know why you hired me? Because I'd go get them coffee. This was at the height of the women's liberation movement. And I'd come in in the morning, I'd go, baby, would you like you some coffee? And he just thought that was the greatest thing in the world, but that didn't last all that long. So at <laughs> any rate, thankfully, um, about um, a year later, one of my dearest, dearest friends saved my life. And this is the day that, be, that changed who I was going to be. She says, hey, baby, I work for a photographer, and he's looking for somebody to photograph weddings for him. Why don't you come and talk to him? Well, you know, he, she says, you have a good camera. And so I said, OK, well, I'm going to do it. So I go to Walnut Creek, California. He had an upstairs studio. And as I walked up those stairs, and he had these beautiful pictures on the wall. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I stuck my hand on the doorknob to walk in. And then I took my hand off the doorknob, ran down the stairs, and ran down the block. This is the absolute truth, folks. I was so afraid he would turn me down that I left the building without even trying. Has anyone ever allowed fear to dominate them and to steal your ability to do something? Hey, I am with you, and I get that. Thankfully, at the end of that block, there was a stoplight, and I had to stop. And then my burning desire to be a photographer overwhelmed and over, overtook my fear of failure. And I decided, you get your butt right up those stairs and you go talk to that man. The last thing you can say is, so what if he says, no thank you? It's just one person. And so I did, I talked myself back in, ran up that building, ran and opened that door and said, hi, I'm Bambi Cantrell. I'm here to talk to you about coming to work for you. He hired me right on the spot, but how could he not? I told him I'd do it for free. <laughs> I'm not kidding, has anybody of you ever done that? Well, you know what? That was the best thing I could have ever done. I got to learn my craft on somebody else's dime. 
And that today is why I'm still a photographer. Because I'm not worried, I'm not afraid of making a mistake. It is not gonna be the only time in my life that I do so. You know, I feel that it's, it's, sometimes we hold ourselves back so much. So now let's talk about the nuts and bolts. What do I use for capture? Um, I do believe in having the good stuff, and I do work with Nikon equipment. Um, I like the D850. Right now, it's my very favorite camera. Here's why I like it. I also have the, the D5, but here's why I like the 850. Number one, it's lighter weight. For you gals that were talking to me earlier, how it's kind of heavy. I like the D8. It's lighter. It is absolutely fantastic. The files are ginormous. It is the, the I tell you what, it's just the most amazing camera that I've ever worked with, period. And then I have a variety of lenses, and I really love, one of the things I love about Nikon is that you can still use the new the, the lenses with your old camera bodies and such, and I think that makes sense to me. I, it was just so annoying to say, oh, we have to get a new camera body or a new lens. Oh, that doesn't work on that body. That's so annoying, so I, I don't like that. So how about tools and props? These days, I, do a, I photograph a lot of families with children. Um, you know, one thing about brides, if you ever shot any weddings, and I have shot literally thousands of weddings in my career as a photographer, they all get married and then they start procreating and having babies. Well, you know what I've learned is that babies and brides have a lot in common. They all have a meltdown at the drop of a hat, and you have to learn to, to photograph really quickly and get expression super fast. So I've learned that there's some things that I can do to, cap to do that. So for tools and props in the studio, I use books and fabric and plastic wrap and bubbles and staplers and tape and window screen. What window screen? Well, you'll hear about more about that later on in newspaper. All of these different things I, I use um, because it's my, my goal to capture expression. Expression beats perfection any day of the week. And so it's really important to me that I try to go for expression. And so that's, that's something I really try for. Of course, I have lots and lots of tools that I work with, as you can see in this, this bag full of camera bodies and such. Here's my studio. I have a full service studio in Northern California. Um, it's 1,900 square feet. But you know what? For those of you who work out of your home, you know what? This could be your living room. I don't feel that you have to have a studio to be a successful photographer. You need to understand the difference between an f-stop and a bus stop, folks. We do. We need to learn that. We need to understand direction of light. And we need to understand you know, what goes into making a beautiful portrait. This is the other side of my studio. Um, it's basically a window light studio, even though I do use lighting when I need to. Um, but I really prefer to use the available or the natural light in a room, if possible. Here's why. Because if I can not have to use a lot, of, a lot of lights and such, it kind of takes that person from being, oh my goodness, I'm getting my picture taken mentality and that fear that they have to, hey, you're in my living room. We're just playing and we're just talking and we're just having a good time. So this is my favorite lighting setup. Um, it's just a wall and a window. Do all of you guys have a wall and a window in your house or in the house that, or, or where you work? Even at, at every church, they have a wall and a window. Obviously, if you want, you, your, my preference is to have a wall that doesn't have a lot of things on it. And if they do, then I just go in and I'll take them off. I've learned to just do what I want and ask for permission later. You know, but there are limits to that. Sometimes it doesn't work. So let's talk about some things that you can do to create beautiful portraiture. Now you'll see that a number of my images have textures on them. I, I like to add a bit of texture because I like to create a little bit of an old world look to my imagery. So let's just dissect this portrait for just a moment. Look at the way that the light, first of all, what direction is the main light coming from? Where is it coming from? Yeah, would you agree? Yeah, it's coming from over, um, the screen's coming from this side over here. Notice how softly it wraps around the subject. And then, do you notice that little highlight across her back? That's how you, you get that, by using a little bit of a reflector. I prefer the sun bounce reflectors. They're a nice, hard reflector. Um, they have a nice, firm, hard stand. And notice that I can just place that reflector here, have an open window here, and then that light will just wrap around the subject. My, perf my preference is about a 45 degree angle to a 90 degree angle. What I'm looking for are highlights and shadows and a little bit more highlight and more shadow. And so you see both of the eyes have a nice illumination. The light is coming from up above and casting in this direction. So you wanna start learning to identify 
where the main light is coming from, whatever kind of light you're using, whether it be a studio, uh, a, a studio a strobe, or whether it be you know, a light from a window or whatever. And so this is how I do it. I have a game that I play with myself called Where is the Light? And you don't even have to have a camera in your hand to do this. That means you can be sitting in a restaurant and you can say, okay, well, where is the direction of light coming from? And how do I best use that light to my advantage? Now, in this particular case, the subject is placed in front of the light source, which is a window. This is in my studio. And I want you to notice the way, the, again, the light is crossing her body. Do you notice the highlight on her, on this arm, on the right arm over there? That's bouncing off a white wall. So even with just a single window, if you learn to, do, to pay attention to where the light is falling and where you can get accent lights, you can, do it, you can use just a simple room with one wall. Or if you're outside, the sun is right here. I want to place, I want to see what it's bouncing off of in this direction, and then my subject's gonna go right here. So in other words, I want to use bounce lighting whenever possible. I mentioned that I use bubbles. I love bubbles because they are really good at keeping a subject in a particular spot. So for instance, and this, this is in my studio, this is just a natural life portrait, and this is of the most difficult subject on the planet, my granddaughter. And I'm here to tell you this child, she will not look in the camera at all. So one of the things I've learned with small children is that if you want them to be in a specific spot, rather than make them stay somewhere, give them a reason to want to be there. And then draw their attention towards where you want them to look. So in other words, in this case, this is her dad, my son, said, you know, just blow some bubbles to Janie, and that would naturally draw her face towards the light source. So you basically use a bit of psychology to be able to, to capture what you need. Now, how do you translate this to weddings? Oh, this is so easy. A wall and a window, a wall and a door, any of those things, just remember, draw your subject towards that. So, um, uh, so I really believe that photography is all the same thing. It, you can be photographing, photographing a family or children or anything else, um, and the same concepts apply. So one thing that is important is getting to know you. How do I get to know the subject? Do I photograph each of my subjects the same way? No, I don't. I feel that it's very important to become very um, visual with your subjects. Who are they? You know, what is it, what makes them tick? And rather than ask a bunch of questions, well, what kind of photography would you like? I never use that question. You know why? Because people don't really know what they want quite often, and they'll pair it something that they've heard before. Oh, well, I want all photojournalism at a wedding. And then they'll go, and then you don't take a formal picture of them and their mom, and they don't look really pretty because you didn't pose them at all. And then guess what? Then they're going to complain to you and say, well, you, you didn't take a picture of me and my mom, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, hey, did you get kidnapped by aliens or something? What's the deal with that, right? So I've learned to use visual cues. What does the person, what does their clothing say about them? Because what you wear says volumes about who you are. Are they minimalists? Are they the kind of individuals who um, have maybe some body art that are a little bit more on the edgy side? Or are they just this little cute couple that just like are the blue jeans and kind of gap shirt kind of thing? So that tells me a lot about how I'm going to photograph. Now, if you take this photograph, for instance, this is photographed outside um, of my studio. The sunlight is actually behind them, and it's bouncing off a white car that is behind me. So I'm the camera. I'm photographing my subject this way. It's bouncing, and I saw this white car. And I, hey, you know what? Guess what? That big white car is a big what? Reflector, bam. And then I'm able to capture an image in the location that I want to. So what if there wasn't a car there? Then I might use my reflector to bounce the light back into my subjects. But learning more about who that subject is, it really helps you to be able to, um, to, be able to photograph in a way that gets your, uh, to get the images that they like. Because at the, the bottom line is, you can photograph for perfection or you can photograph for expression. And I, it's most important that my client like what I'm capturing. That is huge for me because they're the ones who are paying me to do the job. And you know what? This is my profession. It's not my religion. It's my profession. And so if I do a really good job and they're happy with what I've done, guess what? They're going to pay me a really nice chunk of change. So in this case, with this young couple, when they had their first baby, um, I wanted to make sure the bride or the mother came to me. She was also one of my wedding clients when I was photographing. Uh, I shot her wedding. 
And she said to me, Bambi, um, whatever we do, I want to make sure I have this little bear in the picture. So I went into the baby's room, this was shot on location at their home, a very dark bedroom, it was a little boy, so they painted all the walls that dark gray of restoration hardware kind of gray. And then I said, you know what, I want that bear, and I put the bear in that chair so that the, the, the mother of this bride who died of cancer, could, th that could represent her and something that was important to her to tie in that subject. Notice how they're leaning over the baby. The baby's actually laying on top of an ottoman. So I walk into a room and I start noticing, well, where's the main light coming from? And how can I use the best from that one window? Notice that little bit of a highlight on the background, on the wall behind them. That's critical because I not only want the subjects to be illuminated, but I want that bit of background light to separate the subjects from the background. See, if it's super dark back there, then guess what? We're going to have, a, it's not going to show any detail on their hair and it's not going to look good. So let's talk about posing perfection. Posing is, is one of those things that starts with the art of communication. The art of communication is such a powerful thing. Um, let me give you an example. I'm going to give you a visual, a, a physical demonstration of what I'm talking about. So what I want is, for those of you that are, um, that are watching this on TV or, or, or on, uh, on streaming, rather, and those that are here in the room, I want you to stand up. All of you stand up. Okay. Now, for you kids over here, I want you to turn your feet towards me right here. Just turn your feet. Just face me this way. Turn your feet this way. You kids over here, I want you to turn your feet towards me this way. Why did every one of you get it right? Why did you get it right? Because I gave you a physical point of reference. I, I didn't just say turn left or turn right. Because what happens when you do that? If you say turn left, then they go okay and they do this. Or they leave their feet planted this way and they go okay. I mean, does that look natural? That looks stupid, doesn't it? So, so number one, give them a visual point of reference. Number two, the next thing I want them to do is I need to get the weight off of one leg because this is very static. We're standing up very straight and very static. So now, for, uh, if I'm photographing a woman, then I'm going to say, you see this body part right here? It's my hip. Just push it towards my hand. You guys on this side, push your hip this way. You kids over here, push your hip this way. What happens when you do that? Hey, guess what? You automatically put weight on that hip and on that foot. And then this leg right here is just, there's, you've taken the weight off one of those legs. So that's a really easy way to get people to stand better. The next thing we want to do is I want to drop one knee over the other. As in the picture here, you see how she's got that knee bent and then it's dropped over the other leg. Really important. The toe should be pointed forward. Here's why. You see, if I point my toe, my, my toe to the side, you see all the side of my thigh. Not a good thing. I want to see the front of the thigh right here because it's more narrow than the sides are. Are you with me? Okay, so you guys have a seat. So that's super duper easy. And if you take nothing else away from this program, I hope that you take that to the bank because it will literally, it'll make every single subject that you pose better. And guess what? What's really cool is it doesn't matter whether they're facing you or they're turned away from you. That still makes, it makes things look really good. The next thing you want to do is get the arms away from the body. And the reason for that is that the arms next to the body add bulk. And you know what? There's not a woman in the world who wants to look fatter and flatter than she is. We want to look our best. We want to look curvy and relaxed and, and elegant. So that's really an important thing. Um, from behind, it does not matter. Notice in this case, you can't really even see the subject super clearly, um, but notice how in this case, I have her rocking forward. She's got her arms away and she is rocking forward slightly. By the way, she's completely clothed. She's wearing a pair of black leggings. You just can't tell from looking at this. And by the way, this is a non-manipulated photograph, kids. I did not manipulate this in Photoshop. This is a large piece of opaque plexiglass, and she's standing literally this close to it. In fact, I think her bottom is probably touching the plexiglass. And so, but that's how important posing is, kids, because if you pose your subject properly, then you are going to have, it, it doesn't matter whether you can see the person's shape clearly, it doesn't matter whether you're photographing them from the top, from just the waist up, it still makes a difference on the way the body lays. So let's continue to go forward.
Hey, that's how it looks for a wedding image. See how she's got her weight, she's got her hip pushed to one side. That really, and notice again, this is by the way, just over the wall and a window, that light, the way it passes across the shoulders. Now, let's talk about um, body language. What is my body language saying to you right now? Back off, right? Notice what happens if I do one thing. Now what is my body language saying to you? It's saying I'm interested. So the way that you, um, the way if you have somebody lean back with their arms folded, it makes them look more aloof. If you have them slightly lean forward, or in this case, with this groom, I said, hey, with your shoulder, just kind of lean towards the bride a little bit with your shoulder. You see how it makes him look connected to the image. It makes him look connected. Now this, again, is just with that single window, she is the main subject, and then he is a supporting subject in this image. In this case, notice how he's kind of leaning back, but his head is hung down slightly. That is a really, those little tiny subtle nuances make a huge difference. That pose I just showed you, notice what happens. You see, when you have two legs side by side, two legs, see how my legs are side by side? Notice what happens when you bend one knee. You draw the, the attention, it goes down, and then it will go out. So it's very flattering, and it'll make your subject look thinner. Make sure, if you can, to kind of turn the hips about 45 degrees from the, from the camera position. Because notice, I look heavier and bigger straight into the camera, sideways, or about 45 degree. You don't see as much of that person. It's just, it doesn't matter what size your, your, your subject is at all. That little bit of subtle movement like this can make that subject appear like they're moving or they're walking. So if you're photographing in an area and it's, maybe you, you don't have, you're not using a high speed uh, and you want to be able to still capture it and make it look like there's movement, just remember, just have them lean. You notice how I can rock forward or backwards on my feet and it'll give that subject the appearance of, of, being, of walking. Um, I occasionally like to put things in front of my subject this is again shot with just a, a window, a wall and a window. Um, I have these flowers uh, created for this particular photo shoot. But notice the way that her body is turned slightly from the light source. Her body is turned slightly. Why do I want to do that? Well, because when you turn that body slightly away from the light source, and it doesn't matter what the light source is, it could be a reflector, it could be a, a, a window, it could be a, a studio strobe, it could be you know, a, a, any kind of lighting, it doesn't matter. Um, you get that light skimming across the body, and then that gives you highlights and shadows and gives a, a woman beautiful cleavage. So we want to kind of turn her body slightly away from that light source a bit. And guess what? It works just on the guys as well. In this case, he's just sitting, there's a window right over here. I've used a reflector to just give a little bit of a kicker and notice that subtle highlight in the background. So pay attention to what's, where the main light's coming from and if there's a little subtle light source coming from the back that can illuminate the back. And in this case, this is shot just on a couch. That's where I really like working with those fabulous Nikon lenses. My very favorite lens that I work with is the 105-14, the best piece of glass in the entire industry in my opinion. Um, when people are walking, you'll notice with this gentleman who's walking his little dog um, that he's got his legs slightly apart. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to basically tell him to throw one of his legs out and then kind of just walk uh, almost with his legs crossed in the front. So when he picks up that back leg, I want that little bit of a light gap because that's really important for, keeping, for giving context that he's got two legs and giving some movement. Think about where you're going to capture an image. So in this case, a lot of my work is done on location, even though I have a studio. Um, this was for um, a, um, uh, this, there's a company that designed this, this suit for this young man. And I thought, uh, I went into the hotel where we were gonna do the photo shoot, and as I looked out the building, I went, oh my goodness, the, 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 the buildings behind actually kind of mimic the texture and the, the pattern on his jacket. So in this case, I'm exposing for the subject. So light meter, somebody asked me during the break about a light meter. I use the meter in the camera all the time. That's all I use is the meter in the camera. I do know that sometimes that um, I want to overexpose slightly if I'm working for the skin tone and not the background because the light meter might think, okay, the overall scene, this should be something and then it may, it may actually make the subject a little darker. So one of the great things about working with digital cameras these days is you still have 
four stops of exposure. You can do uh, two over and two under. So, um, but I kind of like to get it right in the camera. Somebody asked me about this too. I do try to get it right in the camera. I'm not one of those photographers who, um, who likes to um, take thousands of, Im of images. That's real important for me that I don't take thousands of pictures because the more you take, the more you have to edit or edit out. So I believe if I've got it, why go on? Let's move. So my goal is to get it in one shot, but I may take one or two more just in, so I don't have to do a head swap or a blank. But I'm not a sloppy photographer at all. I know what I'm looking for. I place them where I need to. And once I've gotten that first image or if I've got what I needed, then it's important to move on because that allows you to get a lot more creative um, with your subjects. Um, if you understand direction of light, you can photograph even in a situation like this, this is uh, my daughter's uh, ballet recital, uh, her first ballet recital. I was the most obnoxious grandma on the planet. Um, I actually wasn't. I, I kept my seat. I, I sat on the third row. And this is one of the things I love about th the fabulous cameras that I'm working with. I cranked up the ISO a little bit so I could capture in real time um, her first ballet recital. The, the Eiffel Tower that you see was just in the picture. It was just part of the scene. And I intentionally blurred out the two little kids on the left-hand side because I knew I didn't want to have to go hunt down a model release for them. So um, I mentioned to you, sometimes I have books and props in my studio. Um, I like to try a variety of things, especially with children. I, I believe that with kids, it's real important for them to have fun. If they're not having fun and they hate the experience, we're not gonna, none of us are going to have any fun. And so it's really important for me that they enjoy the experience. So we play games. We, we have magic tricks that we do during the session. My, um, my uh, studio manager also is very talented with magic tricks. So he stands right off camera and starts playing these magic tricks with the kids to engage them towards the lens of the camera. And that's really important because I want a real expression. I don't want these fake smile for the camera kind of things. That's just the cheesiest thing in the world. So once I've laid my foundation of, okay, where's my main light going to come from, my environment, I need to find a way to get them engaged so that they stay still or they stay in one spot where I need them to be. So in this case, with this little girl, we're just playing a couple of little games with her. And then she, of course, lifted her little book up and we were able to get a couple of really wonderful images of her. Um, there are times when, depending on who the subject is, that I, I want to tell something that's a bit more editorial. It's not about seeing um, every nuance of that particular subject. So in this case, by turning that subject away from the light source, notice what I'm doing. I have her hunched even further over. Where, where was I going with this? My goal was to capture that, that little bit of a, a, a cheekbone, to get something that was a bit editorial. And this literally can be done absolutely anywhere. It's just got a stool and a window and a wall. Very, very simple. In the case of working with a bride, you have to think about what are the things that are important to a bride? What is she looking to, what, what is she wanting from you? Obviously, she wants beautiful images of herself and her gown is one of the things she'd like. So in that particular case, it's very important that I flatter her shape. Notice where the main light is coming from in this, in this photograph. And notice that where her head is, there's a little bit of a highlight on that, um, that pillar that's right in the area where her head is to give a bit of separation between her head and the background. And again, notice that she's got one of her knees bent, and I can tell because it's creating tension in the back side. See how she's got a little bit of a, of a little um, highlight on that one cheek, bottom cheek? That You don't get that if you have your subject standing flat-footed, kids. So that little tip that I showed you about bending one knee, dropping the knee over, works great whether they're facing you, whether they're turned sideways, or whether they're turned behind. Um, you want to make sure that you break that. And then again, notice the, the arms. In her case with her hands, I told her with her, um, her center finger here, I said, I just want you to barely touch that, um, that railing with that center finger because it'll make the hand lay nicely. And that's, I, I want to keep the hands from looking like a claw. Use things that are reflective in nature, like a, a, like a window. If you photograph alongside a window, you can capture beautiful, beautiful reflections that are very lovely. And that is uh, what allowed me to capture this particular image. And in this case, notice what's happening with her body. Do you notice how her shoulders are, she's leaning back on her shoulders? What, how did I, what did I tell her to do? Okay, let me demonstrate this to you. You're going to die laughing. Okay, I want you all to stand up again. Okay, now, you kids on this side, you're going to push your hip this way. You kids over here, you're going to push your hip this way. Okay, now the next thing that I want you to do is, this is your pelvis or your tummy. I just want you to push it forward. 
Okay, now the funny part is, is there's this one thing that women in this room will do that men will not. Women, what is the code of womanhood? What's the first thing we do before we push our stomach forward? We suck in, right? Now guys, on the other hand, they'll go, okay, boom, and they'll poke their gut out. It's like, oh, really? You know, so there's so many things that are different between men and women. Is there a woman in this room that would say, pull my finger? No, we aren't going to do that for like, you know, anything like that. So, so we don't do that kind of thing. We as women, we understand the first thing we're going to do is we're going to suck in. So what happens when you press that pelvis forward? Do you see how it naturally drops the shoulder down? And so in the case with this young woman, I want her body turned slightly away from the groom, slightly away, and then press her, press her pelvis forward to drop that shoulder back just a little bit. And it's a really flattering way. Okay, you can have a seat. It's a really flattering way to get that subject to look more engaged with one another. Those subtle nuances in the face to make it look more real and believable. With him, he's leaning slightly forward. And I said with him, can I have you bring your chin forward and then drop it down? So subtle nuances. And here's how you learn how to do that, kids. What I'd recommend that all of you do, stand in front of the mirror and practice this. Because if you can look at yourself, you can see how your body reacts you know, if you bring the chin forward slightly. That, by the way, is a great technique for mature women like myself. Higher camera angles are offer also a great uh, angle for, for women of my age, too. So in this case, with this young lady, she's just leaning forward with her chest slightly and bending that knee. Those subtle nuances have them reach out just a tiny bit with the hand. Say, could you just reach like you're going to pluck a flower? You see, once you have that beautiful, beautiful light source, notice what happens with those knees. You see how we get that if the subject, you notice the subject is not facing the window. You get that? She's not facing the window, and that's important because I don't want the attention to draw to her, just her dress. I want it to skim across that dress. So bending that knee is going to give me a little shadow area right in here, up the chest, and give me a nice uh, shape for the bust line as well. So it really makes a huge difference. When they're seated, Here's a little tip for seating, seating people. Okay, I want you to take a real quick uh, mental picture of the way you're seating, sitting. Okay, now I, I want you all to stand up for a second. This time when you sit back down, I want you to barely park your dukes on the edge of that seat. I mean, barely park your bottom on the edge. So you barely, I mean, I want your bottom basically hanging off. And now I want you to slide back. Do you notice what it did to your back? It straightens up your back, doesn't it? So now the next thing I would want you to do is to take, uh, yep, roll your leg, cross your leg from this way to this way. You kids cross your leg over this way to this way. And now I want you just to roll on your hip a bit more this way or this way. For you kids over here, you want to roll more this way. So you're going to basically be sitting now on this side of your thigh, not on the bottom, not on the back of your thighs. So, and that's what I did in this case. You see, when you have that subject sitting more on this part of the thigh or on the thigh right here, it straightens up the back and it makes them look really beautiful. So it's really, really pretty. In this case, the same thing. I just had her sit on the very edge and then slide back. It changes the center of gravity. Really makes a huge difference on your subject. <clears throat> Let's talk real quickly about backlight basics. I love a backlight situation. I think it's really fun. And it's also a great way to photograph in a location that is not very pretty, like that first Church of Uglyville. I'm sure that some of you have ever photographed in there, right? I know I have. So let's talk about what happened, what you can capture in a backlit situation. Well, how about a beautiful silhouette? <coughs> This is just um, with that big piece of plexiglass in my studio. And with this young lady, I said, it's important for me to have you bend one knee and then drag that foot. So I want her to drag that foot. And then I want you to reach up like you're going to pluck a piece of fruit. And then I was able to capture it just again in real time. And the more that you get right in the camera, the, more that you, you, the less you have to monkey around things, the more money and the more financially um, 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 profitable photography can be. OK, so how about using that same concept for photographing a, a, new, a pregnancy, a, a woman's pregnancy, so that it's not so in your face, you know, pregnancy nude or whatever. Um, sh this woman is behind that scrim is, is, um, is nude. But she may not want to have a nude in her home hanging, but she would possibly have something like this, because it's not like in your face, and it's not like, oh, I'm naked, that kind of thing, OK? So concepts are concepts. 
photographing little kids. Uh, in my studio, I have these large windows. And so I just basically, I made this little platform so that I could take that window and turn it into a door, make it look more like a door. And then we just put a little piece of carpet on the top of it so the kids hop up there along with their dogs. And again, this is the kind of image that you can capture in real time um, in a variety of images for a family portrait session. It's my goal to create images that anyone, that anyone, no matter who the client is, would want to have in their home. It makes a difference photographing um, um, and the, the light meter reading that you give. Sometimes you want to expose for the face. In that case, guess what happens? It, by the way, these last three images were all shot in the same location. Can you see what's going on outside? No. Because if you expose for the subject in a backlight situation, you can overexpose for the background, and it's quite beautiful. The same is with this. Now, in this case, this is really cool. You notice how you can't see what's going on outside. That's important because I don't want any of those distractions. But I noticed that this is a, I have a white curtain, and I had her, I said, grab that curtain. And when I brought it forward a little bit in front of her face, guess what? That white curtain became a reflector and gave me a little bit of a highlight on her face. And that's why I believe that it's so important for all of us to, um, to look for light just naturally, no matter what you're doing. Because if you do that, then you can photograph a wedding or, or a, a bar mitzvah or any kind of session. It doesn't matter what the session is. Um, if you just understand what you will do in that particular concept. And here's how you do it. I think that it's important for us to practice. In other words, give, us, give ourselves what if situations. And what if situations are those kind of situations, well, what if my lights don't work at a wedding? Or what am I gonna do if, if I have a really unattractive room? If you practice ahead of time and you have role played this in your mind, then guess what? You're never gonna be one of those photographers who's going, oh, uh, well, let's try over here. Mm, okay, uh, let's try this. You know what, that didn't work. And um, you know, you see how you lose your mojo. And not only that, but you lose your ability to be taken um, as a professional. So if you've practiced in your mind ahead of time, then you'll be able to work in any situation. Well, like this. Let me give you an example. Can you guess where I shot this image? All of those uh, white marks on the wall are scratch marks because this is in the hall between the banquet, uh, the banquet uh, kitchen and the uh, restaurant at the Howard Johnson's in some little bitty city. And when they, have, when they take the food from the, the kitchen to the banquet room, um, they always bang the wall as they walk through. But I love the light. Guess what the light is in this case? It's just fluorescent light. It's just an overhead light. And I, hey, the wall was black. I, hey, that, that works. How much work was it to take from doing that to this? So you see, if you understand that direction of light, you'll notice, see that little, that subtle highlight that's on her face, and then play up that with the way that you, in other words, turn the face up. You would not photograph that, this image as a high mom, in other words, looking in the camera kind of thing. But it literally opens your mind to new possibilities. I mean, I gotta tell you, that event, I was trying to pull the rabbits out of the hat. What the heck am I gonna do? This is really an ugly, you know, it's not very pretty and not real picturesque, without a lot of effort. Because here's, here's the deal especially on a wedding or, or, or on a, if you have a short time window for a segment you're doing, then you gotta think, okay, what can I get with what I've got? Because maybe you're only given 10 or 15 minutes to do what really you'd like to have an hour and a half for. So that's why sometimes it's important in your mind to have plan B, and I'm a real plan B girl. I love plan B. Okay, what do I have to do if I'm gonna shoot right now? And that's what, when I saw this wall, I went, I'm home, I'm home. A wall, a light, and that's it. I was out of there literally in two minutes. So it means that you can, the quicker that you can do a job and do it amazingly, you can be assured this girl would go tell her family, you are not gonna believe where she shot this image. And I think that's really an part, important part of what I do. How about in an elevator? Again, just the, the, um, just the natural light in an elevator. Um, this is actually one of the elevators in my building, and, and in this case, I used two different kinds of light sources. Um, I used, there's a little tiny window in the elevator. It's a very old building. My building's about uh, 150 years old, 200 years old. And then I used a small ex extra light source on the floor to just kind of give a little bit of separation um, to capture this photograph. And then, of course, we used these, um, these candelabras in there. So just paying attention to where the main light, the main light is that one coming from the window, to give a little bit of separation between her face and that background, that, little, that, that light from that window is also washing that wall behind. So then these beautiful little lights in the foreground give me a really well-rounded image. And it's real important for me that I'm able to capture images in real time in a very efficient way as well. 
How about a hotel room where they have just a simple sign on the wall, which is a piece of artwork that you plug in? I thought, hey, that's kind of cool looking. Um, and again, just with the natural light, placing the subject again where the, this gentleman is placed is strategic, is really important, because we had that little highlight behind his head to create some separation. And then sometimes I'm also going to use um, um, a mixed light when I'm working in a home. In this case, I noticed as this young woman, this was for a bride's magazine, I said, I want you to rock forward. Remember I showed you that idea about rocking forward? I'm going to have you rock forward slightly so I can create a bit of movement. And I, did, I rocked her forward just so I could get that bit of a highlight on her face coming from one of those windows at the top of bright sunlight. I just thought it would be more interesting. Um, and then that was the way I captured it. So the one thing that I think you have to keep in mind if you're using just natural light uh, or, uh, is that don't overexpose. So I expose for the brightest point in the picture. That's really the biggest thing for me is to expose for that brightest point in the picture. So real quickly, let's talk a little bit about movement. I'll tell you, with kids and with people, sometimes if you just get them moving, you are going to have great pictures. Um, just get them. Notice how she's just kind of doing a little bit of movement with her legs. Little kids in the studio, I do this all the time with little kids. I want them running. I want them playing because if they play, then I can capture beautiful images that have emotion and excitement in their faces. This was, I shot this family for many years now, and um, I photograph always in their home. So I look in the house for a, a, just a, an area. It doesn't even need to be very large. Give me just a simple white wall or a, any color wall is fine with that little bit of uh, window light coming in. And notice the where she's, I said, I just want you to just twirl around. And in this case, because she's twirling, yes, I'm going to capture a bit quicker and take a few more images than I would. But I love the expression. And because they're enjoying the experience, I know that I'm going to get what I need to get. And that's really the, the bottom line is, am I going to get what I need to get, and are they going to enjoy that experience? So last but not least, sometimes if you photograph from a higher camera angle, get those arms moving back. Again, she's lifting up her dress. I'm shooting from basically overhead um, to capture that bit of movement. And I like to get people moving. If I have a subject who is very, very nervous, that's to me the easiest thing to do. First thing, get them moving. And, just, and, and I always make them do like a walk-off where they walk and, they, and they, um, I say, okay, I want you just to walk a little bit for me. And then I always tell them they did a really stupid job doing it because I, I want to break the ice and get them to play a little bit. It's, it's my, my goal to, to, um, to just let them, to have them relax so that they don't think that, you know, that I'm going to try to make, I'm not trying to create images that are um, just for a competition or anything of that nature. I'm, comp I'm photographing for people, for real people. And that's really what I am all about. So we're about out of time, and I think we are. I'd like to say very a big thank you to B&H and to Nikon USA for bringing me here. Thank you so much. <laughs>